So I'm here in Tucson, Arizona, and I respectfully acknowledge my presence on the traditional and ancestral lands of the O'odham and Pascua Yaqui, as well as the beautiful saguaro and creosote populated valleys and hills and arroyos nestled between the Santa Catalina, the Rincon, the Santa Rita, the Tortolita, and the Tucson Mountains. And by the way, my name is Simmons Bunton. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the editor-in-chief of Terrain.org. So thanks again uh, for joining us, and happy autumn. I'm wearing my autumn shirt this evening. So I want to first and foremost thank the Michael Donnelly Faculty Fund at Kansas State University for sponsoring tonight's nonfiction reading and discussion. And thank also Elizabeth Dodd, who is our uh, host this evening, and our readers John Price and Jenny Case and Sean Enfield. And of course, I want to thank you, our audience, for joining us here this evening. All right. If your, if your connection becomes slow, you may want to turn off your video. In all cases, please remain muted, but you are welcome to post your questions and other positive feedback in the chat, and I'm sure we will open it up to audio questions, in fact, I know we will, during the Q&A that follows this reading. Well, we are recording this in all readings and conversations, and we'll make these available from train.org and our YouTube channel later this week. And actually, I'd love it if you would follow our YouTube channel, which is at youtube.com slash c slash terrain org, all together. So, this is our first reading of the fall. Next month, on October 24th, we'll host our next reading with award-winning fiction writer Tara Massey and two other writers still to be determined. Links to register for the reading may be found on terrain.org as well as our Facebook page once those have been added at the end of this week. And I should also note that as with this reading, which, by the way, is sponsored by the Michael Donnelly Faculty Fund at Kansas State University, we welcome other sponsors for our upcoming readings. If you're interested, please message me in chat or send a note to info at terrain.org. And here, I'm going to let a few folks in. All right. Now, back to it. So, a word about terrain.org. We are the world's first online journal of place, publishing since 1998, and celebrating our 25th anniversary for a year beginning in November, which is very exciting. And um, I want to have uh, two announcements here. First, we have partnered with the Sowell Family Collection in Literature, Community, and the Natural World, as well as Texas Tech University Press, to offer the Sowell Emerging, Emerging Writers Prize, a new annual book prize for a first or second book that begins with nonfiction this year, and then we'll move to poetry next year and fiction the third year. The prize is $1,000 with a $25 entry fee, and submissions are now open through October 31st via terrain.org and our submittable submission portal. And I believe we're planning on announcing a winner in February or thereabouts. Second, this because this is a first for us. Actually, so is the book series. Lots of firsts for terrain.org this year. Um, beginning October 19th and running through November 2nd, Terrain.org will host its first ever online auction and fundraiser. You'll be able to bid on a wide array of experiences, artwork, literary goods, and more. For example, you can take a guided hike at Tallgrass Prairie National Preserve or participate in the Prairie Chicken Festival with tonight's host, Elizabeth Dodd. Or you can get a tour of New Urbanist Community of Savano here in Southeast Tucson and have lunch or dinner with me just outside Saguaro National Park. Or join Fenton Johnson for a pleasant walk, pleasant talk on the Poets Walk of Rhinebeck, New York. Or join Nancy Lord for a guided skiff ride in Alaska's Kachemak Bay. Or enjoy Michael Branch's Jackalope Kitsch Kit, which I know is going to be fun. I think I have to bid on that one. Uh, take a custom watercolor class with Lynn Baldwin. Or hike the Pinion Nation with Stephen Trimble. Or Grand Manian in New Brunswick with Allison Hawthorne Deming or join poet and naturalist Derek Sheffield on an easy hike in the High School Valley of Central Washington. Or hey, how about joining Pam Houston for a walking tour of Santa Fe? Or join Renata Golden for a birding trip at the Bosque del Apache National Wildlife Refuge? Or you could bid for one-on-one -on -one manuscript critiques from such writers as Allison Adele Hedgecoke, Lee Herrick, Elizabeth Jacobson, Doug Carlson, Janice Ray, Nicole Walker, Suzanne Roberts, B.J. Hollers, Suzanne Frischgore, Ooh, and so much more. So keep an eye out for the auction link and sign up for Terrain.org's e-newsletter, which is at the bottom of the Terrain.org website, to be extra sure you get first dibs at bidding. 
Okay, so a bit more about our little endeavor here. Terrain.org is an all-volunteer organization that, just, that does not charge to access our content, nor charge to submit contests notwithstanding, nor contain advertising. Indeed, we are run by the power of goodwill and dedicated weekends and evenings and undoubtedly lots of caffeine and a passion for our native landscapes and, I like to think, love. And we are run by donations from good folks like you. We are, through our parent organization, Terrain Publishing, a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and donations to support our efforts are tax deductible. So please consider donating at www.terrain.org slash donate. And thank you. Hey, speaking of Derek Sheffield and the Icicle River, let's let him into the reading. Okay. So, finally, a reminder that our regular submissions open again on December 15th, which is a little bit later this year, but we have a pretty healthy queue of work that we're super excited to publish, and so we decided to hold off on accepting for a bit. All right, enough about terrain.org. Let's instead turn to tonight's conversation, followed by Q&A. I will be posting terrain.org and book links in the chat in support of our readers this evening. But if you miss those or want to find other books by tonight's readers and other Terrain.org contributors, hop on over to our bookshop page at bookshop.org slash shop slash Terrain.org or find the link under the About name in the Terrain.org website navigation menu. Also, be sure to post your thoughts and questions in chat as we go along, and we look forward to an engaging conversation following the readings. And finally, finally, thank you again for joining us. So, it is now my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth Dodd. My friend and all-around amazing person, Elizabeth Dodd, teaches poetry, creative nonfiction, and literature and environment courses at Kansas State University, where she is a distinguished, a university distinguished professor. She is the author of six books, including Archetypal Life, Poems, and Horizons Lens, Essays. With Derek Sheffield and me, she is co-editor of Dear America, Letters of Hope, Habitat, Defiance, and Democracy, a collection of poems and essays published on Earth Day in 2020. Her essay collection, In the Mind's Eye, won the Best Book Award from the Association for the Study of Literature and Environment. She is nonfiction editor for Terrain.org, the oldest online journal of place-based writing. Her poems and essays have appeared in journals including Tin House, The Laurel Review, the Fourth River, the Iowa Review, and Places Journal, as well as the anthologies Poetics for the More Than Human World and the Tallgrass Reader. Elizabeth lives in the Flint Hills region of Kansas and serves on the Board of Trustees for Audubon of Kansas. Elizabeth, thank you for joining us to moderate what I know will be a wonderful reading with John T. Price, Jennifer Case, and Sean Enfield. Elizabeth, darling, take it away. Thank you, Simmons, and thank you for um, making this wonderful evening happen for all of us. It's nice to see so many faces that we've seen at previous readings and new faces as well. I'm coming to you from the Flint Hills region of Kansas, which is the ancestral home of many Native nations, including the Kaw, Osage, and the Pawnee. Kansas occupies homelands of several tri tribal nations and is currently home to four federally recognized tribes, the Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation, the Kickapoo Tribe in Kansas, the Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska, and the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska. And this is the largest intact tall grass prairie region in North America. Tallgrass Prairie is the most endangered ecosystem on the planet, as I'm sure John Price would attest as well. It's my pleasure to introduce our readers tonight, and we'll be going in the following order. We'll begin with Sean Enfield, we'll move to Jennifer Case, and we'll finish up the evening with John Price. Um, to echo Simmons, if you have uh, comments, um, questions, you can send them to us through the chat, uh, or you can send them through email to uh, Simmons, sb, at terrain.org, and we'll get to those at the end. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce Sean. Sean Enfield is a writer and an educator. 
He received his bachelor's in literature at the University of North Texas and an MFA in creative writing at the University of Alaska, Fairbanks. His writing grapples with race, education, culture, identity, and has been featured on NPR's All Things Considered. It's been published in Fourth Genre, Hayden's Ferry Review, The Rumpus, and Terrain.org, among others. His manuscript, Holy American Burnout, was named runner-up for Hens Presses and Petri Award, and he is now an assistant nonfiction editor with Terrain.org. Please make him welcome, and Sean, will you please read to us? Gladly. Thank you. I, sorry, I've got a bit of a, my, I love the fall time, but my sinuses aren't catching up, so I've got a bit of a, something going on in my nasal passages. I already have a nasally voice too, so uh, it'll be a fun time. I'm going to read from the essay that brought me into the terrain fold, which I think Simmons just linked. Um, I guess there's not much context needed, but it, some some changes. I When I wrote this piece, it's about a field trip we took when I was working at, working at a middle school, which I used to love field trips when I was a student myself, and then I became an educator, and I hate field trips. So um, Time is an evil thing, but in a positive sense, the me that is narrating in this essay was a curmudgeon about the camping and nature and all that. And I spent four years in Alaska, and I'm, I'm, I have since gone camp, real camping, and I am uh, still have a conflicted relationship with camping, but uh, it's much less uh, aggressively negative. All right, this is called campsite on troubled land. Residents of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex can't be too choosy if they want to experience nature. I grew up amidst its sprawl and eventually began teaching a new generation born of concrete. We are people connected not by the land itself, but by the many intersecting highways snaking throughout. From above, the city is beautiful, awe-inspiring, a garden of indiscriminate lights proving fruitful the march of progress. However, as an instructor at a little private school in Louisville, Texas, my goal was not to attune my students to the city streets that raised them, but to the natural world, perhaps hidden beneath that pavement. Over the course of the school year, our principal threatened many times that she wanted to get these kids outside. She had recently returned from a trip to the Sahara Desert, and now whenever she got the chance, she bemoaned how unattached we all were from our environment. Several times she told me, you must visit Africa to better understand my culture, but I hadn't the heart to tell her that I hadn't the slightest idea which of those arbitrarily drawn borders contained my family lineage. I simply nodded along as she talked about the wide, wild desert as it unfolded from the backs of their rented camels. She'd exclaim, public schools don't get them outdoors, but we can. Eventually, she followed up on her threat. Early in May, the teachers were handing out permission slips for a weekend camping trip to Lake Louisville, approximately 30 miles north of Dallas, but just a few miles from our school. I had been all over this metroplex, lived and worked in its many ever expanding suburbs and so believed myself intimately familiar with its landscapes. However, I had never gone camping here or anywhere. In her essay, The Art of Finding, poet Linda Gregg asserts that she is made of the landscape where she grew up, meaning in her case, her father's uninhabited mountain, but the live oak trees, the stillness, the tall grass, the dry smell of the hot summer air where the red-tailed hawks turn slowly up high. By that metric, I am made of my father's driveway with its broken South Dallas concrete, telephone poles with basketball sneakers, hang sneakers hanging over the telephone wires and the hot and humid air, and roadkill raccoons with outstretched arms animated only by North Texas winds. It is easy to become blind to this space with its industrious skyscrapers rather than say, majestic redwoods. These impressive feats of human engineering quickly become commonplace if you walk those streets constant enough and drunk enough. Still, I felt at home here. I delighted in riding the light rail into the city, then hopping buses as we moved from one air conditioned bar to the next. I am not what you would call outdoorsy, but chaperones can't be choosy. And so I found myself pitching tents at a campsite near Lake Louisville. Thankfully, I was not expected to camp myself, only to help set up monitor kids until nightfall, nightfall, and then return in the morning to monitor kids until teardown. Although, since we're only a short drive away from the school and their homes, it's hard to call what the students were doing camping. 
The principal and her children slept in an RV which loomed over the tents with all the might of industry. All hail the Winnebago Grand Duke of Machinery. We could see our cars from the parking lot which ran right up to the edge of the campsites. When we arrived, the principal shoved an envelope of cash into a metal box that allowed her, me and Christina and the other, unluck the other unlucky young teacher chosen as chaperone to park our cars without harassment from the park manager. Car cars trickled in and out all evening long. Neither Christina nor I had ever set up a tent before, and so we flipped through the instructions which read like hieroglyphics until eventually we just told the students to turn it into an engineering challenge. Figure out where these poles go and you win a candy bar, she told them. Prior to her command, one of the students remarked that the tent pole when unassembled looked like a really long nunchuck. And sure enough, he dragged, dragged the long threaded stick behind him, trying to whack his brother with the end. After it was made a challenge, however, the students set to studying the instructions, bickering with one another about how they interpreted the instructions. You're supposed to put the long nunchuck on top of the tent, a student said, as he laid it atop the sad, wilted tent body splayed on the grass. Every now and then the tent lifted with the ever-present North Texas wind, and so a student, frustrated by the actual engineering part of the task, elected himself in charge of sitting on it so that it wouldn't fly away. Eventually, the students gave the tent shape and stability. The class clown delighted in hammering the stakes into the ground, swinging with all the force of John Henry racing the machine. Christina and I winced as we watched, but thankfully he spared his own fingers. Even with the tent raised, this was more a mirage of camping. What we knew from very special episodes of sitcoms in which characters left the set and told stories around a campfire. Later in the evening, however, we tell stories around the charcoal grill a workaround to the perpetual burn bands in North Texas. I don't know what it means to know this landscape, and yet I can't deny that I am made of it. Not any African country from which some great ancestor was stolen, nor its vast wild deserts. No, I'm composed of the municipal water drawn from the lake where we camped. Lake Louisville remains one of the six reservoirs from which Dallas and its surrounding cities and suburbs sources its drink drinking water. I have lived in the city itself and several of its suburbs, and up to that point, I had lived nowhere else. Our bodies are 70% water, and I have spent most of my life drinking from Lake Louisville. In 2015, the Lake Louisville Dam became the subject of national attention when record-breaking spring rainfall left the dam critically near failure. The Dallas Morning News published a report which haunted my commute with a map of that beautifully sprawled city stained with the blood red key indicating the possible floodway Seepage under the dam's foundation had created what the reporters called, called a sand boil, which looked like a small whirlpool spinning and spouting from underground. This whirlpool, if unpatched, could lead to rupture. 431,000 people were in the potential flood path, our school included. I couldn't help but envision the flood in biblical proportions. Every weekday, I drove over the bridge and, that separated my home just north of the lake to the little school that would be swept up in the tsunami-like wave. We, the unchoosy residents of the Metroplex, all continued forth, driving down I-35 as if it couldn't someday become the highway to Atlantis. Such is the call of the urban landscape that even when faced with apocalyptic precarity, the mechanisms of camp capital turn ever onward. So now I stood at the banks of that potential apocalypse, disturbing its still water with stones found along the shoreline. The campsite was up a hill a few feet behind us, Looking down, our principal must have watched as her students became one with the water from which they were made. What emerges in damaged landscapes, asked Anna Singh in The Mushroom at the End of the World, beyond the call of industrial promise and ruin? We do, I suppose. We become the places where we work, walk, work, and play. We become the water we drink. What we do after emerging, however, plagues my anxiety. Do we just become the fleshy tools of industry, the arbiters of ruin? As an educator, I've always thought my role was to teach students how to navigate this broken earth and maybe even help to mend it. Indeed, any teacher of language arts at our most hopeful might consider themselves a guide to damaged landscapes. The lake water was brown and murky, the trash littered beach washing inward. Still, our students splashed about as if we were at a water park. I trailed slowly about, making sure their play was wholesome and inclusive and not mean spirited. Most often, however, the splashing meant a middle schooler had tossed a first grader into the lake like I did rocks from the beach. As their guide, should I have informed them that the water in which they played so violently would later be filtered through their sinks, ice machines, and toilets, 
Should I, as an older body molded from that water, have helped him find the poetry in that damaged landscape? The next morning, when I returned to the campsite and the principal asked me to leave that class on a walk, I gave them no guide to navigating the broken space. I didn't trust that they'd take it seriously, but maybe I sold them short. Who knows what they might have realized with the right charge. They, after all, had figured out the tent. I just wanted to get through the morning. The cloud of gnats hovering in the trees along our path reminded me why I preferred the concrete parts of these landscapes. I watched as the students took off wild before me. A little way from the campsite, I noticed the five-year-old, the principal's youngest son, who was also entreated to, entrusted to my care, had set out in flip-flops. His, his feet were stuck all over with thorns and stickers, though I was more bothered by this than he. He even giggled as he plucked them. Once the thorns were out, I hoisted him onto my shoulders and told him to reach for the sun. Soon, my back ached. The afflicting weight giggled overhead and wiggled as he maneuvered to point out birds beyond my field of view. Meanwhile, the rest of the hiking group ventured almost out of sight. As their English teacher was it my job to teach them the meanings of the words, hold on everybody? I told the little guy upstairs, changing the curvature of my spine to duck out of the way of the branches and to stop putting leaves in my afro as I set off in the wilderness searching for preteens. The hot sticky moisture and the itchy brush of tall grass reminded me why I hated the romantic poets. Elliot was right, April is the cruelest month, May a close second. The preteens emerged from the thickets of wood, bearing sticks and physically bringing each other closer to nature and over and over again. We were at the site of potential ruin as I could have helped them see. Notice here, steep into the ground, water building up and applying pressure to the dam a few months away from the patch job that would further delay disaster. Notice here, the 90 degree day in the middle of May, leading its way into another summer of record breaking heat. Notice here, the five-year-old shouts squirrel and the students all sprint after. Their teacher trails behind, distracted briefly from ruin as we made our way back to the parking lot. I averted my attention back to the students, then retreating from the road back to the woods and set the five-year-old down because he spotted a lady, ladybug. Where does the give and take of landscapes begin? Where does the give and take of landscape and bodies begin? Where does it end? Typically a camping trip is supposed to provide an escape from the humdrum of urban living. Campers claim to be rejuvenated by the fresh air and whatnot. And here we were with tents pitched just a few miles from I-35, pollution coloring the sky with shades of candy corn. If we do emerge from our landscapes, then camping near the city's reservoir is like returning to the womb. We re-emerging then would confuse more than rejuvenate. I understand why the principal chose this reservoir though, as absurd as a facade of nature as it was. There's justification alone in making sure students didn't grow up to be another 25 year old city slicker who couldn't pitch a tent. And yet still, I thought we were teaching our students to notice the wrong aspects of our environment. Our environment isn't an uninhabited mountainside with lush and tranquil vistas. Getting to know this landscape instead is to contend with the ways in which we have altered it forever. We have no ancestral land, no countryside, this kind of camping then teaches us that the so-called natural world is something separate from the environment that we call home, when in truth, those divides are as fragile as our troubled dam. Perhaps something beyond industry and ruin could emerge from a damaged landscape if its residents could see that space like a poet. America's is a restless and rootless history. Someday I would leave Dallas, yet I notice how quickly I still call it home, though home has never been easily defined in this country. It's not that I love Dallas or even that my immediate family still lives within its sprawl, but that the memories made there follow me like the ancestors I claim to lack. As a black man, I know that if the dam broke, even that biblical flood could not level this country. The rich suburbs would just turn the flood path into a community pool. But also as a black man, I've learned from other black Americans how to salvage a landscape in which the governing powers actively disrupt your belonging. Maybe ain't no home, writes poet Nate Marshall, except for how our, your beloveds cuss or pray or pronounce. Rootless, maybe, but resourceful. We find ways to love our landscapes through our people. There beside me at the campsite, the five-year-old sticks his finger in the dirt. His back is bent with his knees tucked under and his gaze, and his gaze is transfixed by a la ladybug, cooing at it as if it were a cat. Eventually, it spirals up his finger, and he arches slightly to hold it up into the sunlight. Two decades late prior, I hunched atop the cracked concrete leading up to my child home in the city proper. Eyelashes brushing the dirt off the pavement, I used my fingertips to scoop roly polies out of the driveway's trenches. Behind me, my sisters combed the concrete for bugs of their own. 
I smiled whenever one curled onto my fingertip and held the bug up for my sisters to see. Look, Mr. Sean, the five-year-old exclaimed as the ladybug took flight from his finger and ended the air. Louisville Dam has yet to break. It retains its water. The city has pledged $150 million over an eight to 10 year span for repairs, which would hopefully mitigate potential ruin. Though whenever the city suffers abnormal rainfall, the local news ponders if maybe this time the dam will break. For the time being, I hoist the five-year-old back onto my shoulder, steer the adventuring preteens back toward the campsite and wonder what mate weight might someday replace existential ruin. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And next we will have Jennifer Case. Um, Jenny, do you need a minute to get things loaded up that you're going to be sharing? Nope, I'm good. Rock and roll, okay. Um, <clears throat> so Jennifer Case is the author of Saw Bill, A Search for Place, uh, published with the University of New Mexico Press. Her writing overall explores issues related to place, environment, home, family, and motherhood. Her essays have appeared in journals such as The Rumpus, Orion, Ecotone, Literary Mama, Diagram, and North American Review. She's a recipient of a Breadloaf Bakeless Scholarship and Stone Canoes Allen and Norell Galson Award. She teaches at the University of Central Arkansas and serves as the assistant nonfiction editor uh, of terrain.org along with Sean. And she is also the maker of truly wonderful small postcards. Please make welcome Jenny and will you please read to us. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, and everyone for being here this evening. I really want to thank Simmons and Elizabeth for inviting me. It's an honor to read alongside Sean, who I've enjoyed working with on the Terrain crew, and also to read with John Price. When I was a young grad student interested in writing about place, some of John's books about Iowa were, were the first books that really made me think as someone from Minnesota, maybe I could make a career as a place-based writer, writing about some of the locations I love. So it feels extra special to read with, with John and Sean this evening. I have most recently been writing about motherhood, so I'm going to share two short pieces with you this evening. And the first is a letter to America that Simmons and Elizabeth and Derek were kind enough to, to publish and support I think in July it came out, so not too long ago. And this is a piece that oscillates between images made out of collage postcards, like the one Elizabeth shared, and then some prose. So I'm actually going to share a screen so that you can see the images. And I'll let them be on top for a minute, and then I'll read the prose that goes with it, and then move to the next. So this is called Continue to Be. A few days after Roe is overturned, my husband's uncle posts a meme that says, pro-choicer, well, what do you do to help these children? Pro-lifer, we don't kill them for starters. I have always respected my husband's uncle. He was a psychotherapist for years and we once sat quietly on the outskirts of my husband's family gathering and had a long conversation about mindfulness and writing. So his meme surprises me. Although I have long known of his deep Catholicism, I did not expect that someone like him, a retired psychotherapist who practices mindfulness, has surely worked with many female clients and understands the complexities of people's lives, would fall into that kind of polarization. I understand that his faith is sacred to him and that people tend to dig in their heels as they age, but still, it saddens me deeply, partly because it illustrates how quickly so many can overlook women's real embodied lives, and partly because it reveals exactly how intractable this conversation has become. The truth is, when the news about Roe came out, I could feel it in my body, not like a gut punch, but something worse and something deeper. 
I felt a violation in the deep recessed thrumming part of myself that knows what it is like to feel forced to give birth. I have had a planned pregnancy and I have had an unintended pregnancy and I know what it is like to pee on a stick and come up against a husband, a mother, a family, a society, a political system and a religion that will not allow me an option. That tell me I will get over my despair and that my life doesn't matter and that I have no choice because there is only one choice. I know what it is like to collapse under those pressures and to lose my voice to stare at myself in the mirror and not recognize the sallow tightness in my face or the growing belly, to think my life is over, to want to die. I know what it is like to be a parent in that state, to not be fully present for my children. There's a photograph I keep on my phone taken when my son was just shy of two months old. He sits in my lap in a green onesie flopped against my left arm. Light from the window has solarized one of my shoulders and half of my face, but I grin into the camera, a playful crinkle in my nose. My son, gaze not fully focused, looks upward toward my voice and smiles, cheeks so full they sag from the fatty milk of my breasts. I keep the photo because it is precious, because I would like to believe that moment was real, the joy it looks like I got from him the comfort and security he seemed to have in my lap. Everything they say about unintended and unwanted pregnancies is true. That the mother is at a high risk of postpartum depression. That mother-infant attachment can be compromised. That there are economic and professional losses the mother will not be able to recoup that the physical, mental, and emotional tolls can, la land lo can last long after the birth, that socially marginalized women, black women, and other women of color face even higher risks. I have spent the last six years untangling my experience, placing it in context, and what I know now with certainty is this, we are interconnected. A mother's health reveals the health of the society around her. I struggle with my husband's uncle's meme, maybe because I had respected him, maybe because he was partly family, maybe because it represents for me in this moment all the emptiness I kept coming up against in my upbringing and youth. I had expected him to have more compassion, but when I confront him, he is unapologetic. He simply says, when it comes to the life of a child versus a woman's right to choose what to do with her body, I will choose the child. My anger is an energy field, like starting a fire with just a magnifying glass and the sun. I am starting to feel my own power, I suppose, or a certain kind of groundedness. In my meditation group, we discuss how to transform fear and anger into love and I do that now, my anger and fear becoming a fierce love for all the people I know who will be hurt by this, for all of the harmful messages about their bodies these laws will perpetuate and create. A mentor suggests that some of my anger is residual, the anger I was unable to express when pregnant. I close my eyes to ponder the thought. I try to imagine what decisions I would have made then if I'd allowed myself this feeling. What does it mean if the greatest lesson my son's pregnancy has taught me is that sometimes I need to choose myself? I will have no more children. I will not sit silently when someone implies I am less. I will know in my bones what the right and necessary and moral decision is. And I will hold and embody that knowledge and power even when it causes discomfort to those around me. That weekend, I take the kayak and paddle the water trail of a nearby slough. It is perfect as always, the deep hush and throbbing as I maneuver between Tupelo and Cyprus. A snake wraps itself around a dead tree trunk. A few fish lick insects from the lip of the lake. Everywhere, energy fields and life forces so much larger than my own. How much we have misunderstood motherhood, I realize how narrow and incomplete all of our conceptions are. 
Here, even gender has nothing to do with it. Where the trees open up into still water, the kayak holds me. I can be part of it all. All right, and now I'll read another short one. This came out this past spring, I believe, in Diagram. I don't know what to call it, maybe nonfiction, maybe a prose poem, I'll let you decide, but I'll read it just the same. It's called Message for the Animal Mother. You are teats tingling, hairy line from your pubis to your belly button, stretched skin that has spread and then shrunk to create ripples and dapples. You are bite and aching neck and an arm that always reaches out and will hold a child when they need to be held and will grab that child when they need to be held back. When children hit their heads on a rock or a table or the thinly carpeted floor, you will run to them and hold ice to the pulsing bruise and in the backside of your left cheek, a bulge of your own will burgeon. You are power, though you do not always know it. You are sparks and mirror neurons and a life force throbbing to reach the future. But sometimes you forget this. Sometimes you lie in bed or wish you were lying in bed or wander through the rooms of a dark house, a dark cave. Sometimes you push your fingers deep into rocky clay soil so deep you cut your finger on stone, and still the barb at the back of your chest is a barb, and still your mind is full of voices that conflict. Something pulls you elsewhere, and something holds you here, and you do not know which is the better choice, and so you stay. Mothers have lost themselves in this space, hands on children, hands in the sink, hands in water turning red and then clear and then frothy. Mothers have brushed their children's hair and seen their own selves spiraling upwards like the strands of a spider web, filaments floating and breaking in a breeze. A snail crawls across red bricks on the sidewalk, grit on grit. A blue egg cracks in the gutter. Where are you now? Once you were young and like all of us, naive, and this is how it always is, so don't beat yourself up. Once you thought motherhood wouldn't be bristle, the sharp knob on the back of your neck, the sharp throb of a nerve two inches right of your left armpit. Once you thought motherhood meant familyhood or something like that, forgetting that it was you who was the mother, you alone, mouth open and then clenched on a dark and throbbing night. Do not believe this is anyone else's story. Do not believe this is anyone else's choice. When you stare into the lake or the river or wipe the mist from the smoky mirror, you will only see yourself. Oh, mother, you don't believe me. I see you caving in like a carcass, so full of fear you've already made yourself dead. I see you eyeing the white cloth, the small sock, the twisted clasp of the bra. You don't believe me that the anger in you is part of being a mother. You don't believe you will remain a mother just the same. You don't believe that the eye flash, hiccup, aching longing to be elsewhere is one and the same with the hug so tight you feel your child's bones. Oh mother, the time will come when the belly will glisten and the sky will open and the mud will seep to your ankles. The time will come when the den is empty and the nearly grown daughter will stand at your side. The time will come when the leaves crackle a message and you will let go of all the things you need to let go of and your body will lighten so much you will fly. But until then, lean close and listen. Hear the fervent scratch in my voice. In the deep folds of your pelvis, in the center of that hardened fist, you have always known the answer. You have always made the choices you needed to make. You are not stupid. And when the next choice comes, you will gather yourself, milk bones and bristle, and you will go. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. And we'll turn third to John Price, and then we'll come back as a group for some Q&A um, for all three writers. John T. Price is the author of five books of creative nonfiction, 
including man killed by pheasant and other kingships, kinships, and most recently, All is Leaf, Essays and Transformations from University of Iowa Press. He's also the editor of the Tall Grass Prairie Reader, the first anthology entirely dedicated to tall grass nature writing. A recipient of a prose fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as other recognitions, he has published essays in venues including Orion, the Christian Science Monitor, Creative Nonfiction, Fourth Genre, The Iowa Review, Brevity.com, Essay Daily, and Terrain.org. His work has been reprinted in a number of anthologies, including Best Spiritual Writing of 2000, How to Speak to One Another, An Essay Daily Reader, and Dear America, Letters of Hope, Habitat, Defiance, and Democracy. He is the Regents Foundation Distinguished Professor at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, where he directs the English Department's Creative Nonfiction Writing Program. He and his family live in the beautiful Luss Hills of Western Iowa. Please welcome John. And John, will you please read to us? Thank you, Elizabeth. It's such an honor to be here today to read with Denny and Sean. I wanna thank uh, Simmons and Elizabeth, uh, not just for this event, but for, um, and everyone at Terrain for that incredible journal. Um, I'm gonna read from this new book, uh, All is Leaf, which I often fondly say was the book that Terrain created uh, because it's true. Uh, Terrain created a space for me to ex do some experimenting uh, with nature writing and environmental writing, do things I hadn't done before and didn't think I could do. And uh, I really appreciate the space that they gave me to do that and the spirit of that kind of experimentation spilled over into this book as a whole which is about change about transformation um, environmental personal political uh, each chapter is different in form um, and often in voice there are a number of pistolary essays um, and i'm going to read one of them um, i'm going to break one of the rules cardinal rules of reading and read the last chapter in the book i don't there's no spoilers in this but um it's a piece that was also published in Terrain. It was published in March uh, of 2020, um, just on the verge of the COVID-19 shutdowns. And um, it's meant to bear witness to the communities that uh, we had prior to that, uh, the worries that we had about what was going to happen to them. And um, it's dedicated to everyone that's suffered, lost uh, during this last, uh, these last, few years uh, from this horrible disease. Um, it's called Pizza Night on Planet Fitness. And it's addressed to the CEO of Planet Fitness. March 2nd, 2020. Dear Mr. Rondo, it is the first Monday of the month and I am once again attending free pizza night here at the local Planet Fitness aka No Judgment Zone, where I have been a member for six years. I was particularly intent on intend attending tonight because I do not know how long it will be before I return. Although there are currently no confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Nebraska or Iowa, rumors are that it may soon lead to mass hospitalizations and business closings and major alterations in our lifestyles, including limiting contact with places like this where human beings freely touch the same surfaces, exchanging sweat, spittle, high fives, and more than a few tears, and pizza. I'm not writing to debate closing your doors. I know the decision will be a hard one, or if the threat continues to rise, no decision at all. I'm writing only to explain what this night, this place, has meant to me, and perhaps a few others it has served. But first, let me say something about this pizza which is smelling really good right now. It looks like the teenage attendant ordered a nice variety tonight, pepperoni, sausage, veggie, even a gluten-free option. My favorite is the Supreme and it's seriously calling to me. No Hawaiian as usual, which has always disappointed my wife when she's attended first Mondays, but you can, you can be forgiven for that. 
The concept of pineapple as a topping has always been a little controversial, sort of like serving pizza in a health club. On the other hand, sorry, I confess I had mixed feelings when Planet Fitness first came to town. You replaced the Barnes and Noble, which had occupied this space for about a decade. When my books came out, I gave readings here to local people, mostly those who knew me personally, mostly elderly, some of whom had since passed away. I miss them. They were from a generation that valued books enough to purchase them. They didn't shop online, but at stores like this Barnes and Noble, which was the only store in our town to stock my books because it was the only bookstore. I miss all the physical books that used to inhabit this place in the massive magazine stand and in the cafe, the scent of espresso and the panorama of famous authors that made you think you were invited to sit among them. I'd give anything right now to join the table with Nabokov and Orwell, but it's more than that. When this space was a bookstore, my young sons played at the table with the Thomas the Tank Engine track, talk about germs, beneath the Winnie the Pooh 100 acre woods panorama, which was where the leg press machines are currently located. Later, the boys dressed up as Harry Potter and Ron Weasley for the grand release party of the final Harry Potter book. In the general vicinity of the ab crunchers, they sat and drank butterbeer, flicking their wet straws at one another and laughing at the big bearded man dressed as Hagrid. The place was crowded and overheated and people were breathing all over one another. But even then I thought, when will we ever see such a spirited, sticky gathering of generations to celebrate the release of a physical book? Now this entire section of the mall is set to be demolished and replaced with the Menards. Even though you've committed to moving only a short distance away, I'm still grieving the loss of the mall. In its prime, it contained not just the bookstore, but other places that meant something to us. The movie theater and the KB toys and the holiday Santa display and the video arcade and the glow in the dark mini golf course and the ice cream store and the lily pond themed play area where the kids climbed barefoot on the backs of frogs and drooled on giant dragonfly wings while we sat and took pictures. We were totally in love with those children, all of them. The frogs are gone now, but the spongy carpeted area is still there along with the unimpressive gray tiles. On these same tiles unchanged during our years here, our boys toddled at first holding our hands, then ran to and from our arms, countless reps. To watch a child grow up has its joys, but it can also feel like a kind of death, a double death when the physical places those children used to inhabit disappear. Sometimes when I am doing another set on the leg press, I think I hear a train whistle and the voices of those little boys. Sometimes I think I see them running at me and the weight I'm lifting with my legs is their bodies and I'm carrying them. Then I snap out of it due to the knee pain and find myself once again alone with my body. But let's get back to this pizza. It's Domino's as usual, which always makes me happy right off the bat on first Mondays. There's some history to share about this. In college, I basically survived on lu lukewarm slices purchased at the corner Domino's near my boarding house. In the evening, I would walk home from the library or from a pickup basketball game with my buddies or just an aimless walk, body aching pleasantly and grab a slice of Supreme and a liter of Pepsi. The food was cheap, which was good because I was student for, poor. So I ate a lot at that Domino's alone and with friends, so many friends back then, at an inside table under the fluorescent lights after midnight or outside on the curb to watch the setting sun paint the sky. So much pizza, so much youth, cheap and warm and filling. Ah, Domino's, it pretty much smells the same, which is wonderful. As I inhale, I can feel that earlier younger body stir within me calling, I am still here. You can find me if you feed me. A siren song, I know, but it still beckons. When I look around here at Planet Fitness, I see several other familiar strangers who have been with me from the start. They are my involuntary support posse. I don't know what I would do if I didn't see at least one of them every time I came in here, which is sometimes every other day and sometimes not at all for weeks. They don't judge me for that. 
However long it has been, we always acknowledge each other in some way, a wave or chin jerk or just a prolonged staring that in any other context would be sort of creepy. We know each other not by our names, but, our, but our, by our faces, our bodies, some of which have transformed dramatically since we first became aware of one another. I feel a deep affection for them, these bodies. My teenage son, who used to play with toy trains here, once made a snide remark about a boomer in yoga pants taking her sweet time on the chess machine he was waiting to use. I think he was surprised by my harsh reply, for which I apologized later. He's a good kid, but I needed him to know how much I care for these people, my companions. They haven't come here to get toned for spring break or the downtown bar scene, even if both get canceled this month. No, they have come here to save their lives. I will not tolerate any mockery of them. There is, for instance, the woman with the military tattoos on her arms and the massive scar on her upper left shoulder. She's in her late 30s or so and sings badly at the top of her lungs while on the treadmill, punching the air and cheering for herself. She's cheering for all of us and our private victories on battlefields real and imagined. At least that's how it feels when I'm on a trend, treadmill anywhere near her. It gets me going. There's another woman about the same age, a former high school athlete, whose husband cheated on her with her best friend. Now she comes here with her older brother. The siblings laugh and talk loudly, which is how I know about the husband, and high five in between beating the shit out of the 20 minute workout machines, all of which are colored coward yellow, like her ex. There is a middle-aged couple who doesn't seem to have a lot of money. You can kind of tell these things by the range and brand of workout clothes people wear. I'm sorry to say such comparisons do take place even in the no judgment zone. This couple wears the same loose gray sweatpants and long sleeved Ocean Pacific t-shirts from the 80s. His is white with pink lettering, hers is pink with white lettering. Both have images of palm trees on the back. They always show up together and will use only the same kind of machines and only if they are side by side. And they always exercise in sync, same pace and same number of reps and sets. It never changes. Over the last few years, the length and pacing of their exercising has increased. Those once tight palm tree t-shirts becoming on the treadmills like triumphant flags flapping loosely in the wind. But the ritual has never wavered, always together, always to the same invisible beat that has bound them from the beginning. Then there is Myron, a friend of the family. He's maybe 40 and is a long time weightlifter ripped from top to bottom. Every now and then he clanks a few desk, discs and set off the lung alarm. But did you know that his mom re died recently from lung cancer? Plus he's a really nice guy. Just last week, Myron brought his aunt along for the first time who was around 70 and a former smoker like his late mother, her sister. He was patient and encouraging while coaching his aunt on the machines, even though she sometimes couldn't complete one rep. I overheard her engaging in a lot of self-judgment. She actually started talking to me about it, about how her body used to look, what it was capable of doing. And she and Myron, as she and Myron waited for me to finish on the chess machine, she started crying. So I stopped and gave her a hug, even though we were pretty sweaty. And she hugged me back and asked God to bless me. Maybe I'll be telling my grandchildren this is what it was like in before COVID times. I don't want to get anyone in trouble, but there's a teenager here tonight who's on his third slice of pizza. Some of my fellow boomers are giving him judgmental looks. Personally, I think he and the other teenagers should be allowed to eat as much pizza as they want. In fact, you should encourage them to do so if you don't already. Our job at this age is to feed them because that's always been the job of people our age or should be. As COVID-19 has spread, I've heard a lot of critical terms thrown around about his generation, reckless and different, narcissistic, health privileged is a new favorite. Privileged is not a term I associate with most of them. For a variety of reasons we can lay right at the feet of people our age, they're mostly poor or will mostly be poor. I'm not just talking about money. We've left them vulnerable to the future in ways we can hardly understand since we won't live to see it. And yet, despite all the ways we've let them let them down, the occasional homeless person from my when the occasional homeless person from my generation comes here on first Mondays to eat some pizza and get a hot shower without officially checking in, 
these same young people who manage the desk invariably turn a blind eye. They pick up their wet towels. They feed them. This makes me love their generation even more than I already do. I'm afraid that in future centuries, when the hot water and a lot of other things run out, we won't be able to send them a pizza of gratitude. So let them have as much as they want right now, okay? But what is the pizza exactly? What does it mean? Surely it is more than its individual toppings or crust style. Is it about self-reward, self-denial? Whatever it means, it cannot be escaped, not on first Monday pizza night. Wherever you go in the club, you will smell it, even if you don't eat it. Even if they provide as they do veggie and gluten-free options, it smells the same like whatever it is you think you need, youth, courage, health, compassion, food. The pizza will not be ignored or forgotten, it sings. If consumed, it will do inside whatever work it was meant to do according to the age and composure of the body that consumes it, according to what that body has accomplished or not over the last hour or decades, whether completing an additional set of 15 reps on the arm curl or passing a kitty stone or having a baby. Each slice of pizza, no matter what, will transmogrify into something entirely different inside each of us, a tightening bicep or a loosening layer of belly fat a self-gratification or self-flagellation, hate or love or the memory of love, how many lifelong relationships, friendships, marriages, as well as impulsive carnal mistakes were facilitated by pizza. Pizza for some of us has revealed new worlds. In college, I once consumed a slice with sausage and magic mushrooms and it changed my perception of the color green forever. It changed as well the possibilities of what I thought a face might become in an, to another face in perpetual metamorphosis in waking dream, as beautifully warped and fleeting as a spring rain on a candlelit window. That is the human face compared to what resides eternal behind it. That is pizza. Still, it is becoming clear that COVID-19 will change our lives forever. I worry about my friends here and their loved ones, as well as my own. When will we, we see each other again, if ever? I do not know, but it seems likely that at the very least this pandemic could lead to the permanent termination of first Monday pizza night. If so, and if we return, I would humbly suggest ordering the pizza anyway and keeping it behind the counter. The smell alone might temporarily overcome the stench of hand sanit sanitizer and fear, becoming a reminder of what we used to mean to one another, freely exchanging the sweat of our struggles wordlessly confessing the otherwise secret longings and courage of our souls, demonstrating for all to see the possibility of individual and collective morphogenesis like leaves, because all is leaf, our bodies becoming the place where new growth sprouts from the point of separation from earlier selves, once thought inseparable. So yes, the pizza smells good and it's loaded with essential meaning, but I have decided to deny myself a small sacrifice ahead of larger ones to come. Maybe it will leave more for the teenagers. I will instead dial up Led Zeppelin on the earphones and then perhaps for the last time in a while, join my fellow human beings, my loves on the stepping machines. Perhaps for the last time in a while, we shall save, save our breathing in close, close proximity, the scent that calls to our common hunger, our bodies going through the motions of what we should know as an absolute truth whether we recognize it or not, that we are like that married couple, always in perfect sync with one another, always climbing together the stairway that never quite leads to heaven, trying to save our lives with each breathless step. Affectionately yours, John Price. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, audience. Um, I see there's been some response in the chat. Um, probably there's uh, topics for Q&A. Um, I'd like to get started with one. Um, and if others uh, don't speak up, I've got a couple of others, but uh, please, please do formulate some questions or comments that you'd like to make to the authors. Can I address my first question to both Sean and John? And something that I like so much about both of your essays that you read this evening is the mixture 
of um, amusement at the human condition um, and serious contemplation of its depth and the ability to gaze at um, a wounded landscape um, or the beginning of the pandemic and still have good spirited humor. That seems to me like a really important thing for a writer to offer the world right now. And I hear it in both of your pieces. Would either of you like to just comment a little bit on, um, on what it means for you uh, to have this kind of amplitude of the humorous and the serious in your work? Go ahead, Sean. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I worked with uh, somebody at my MFA and she said, your poems are so funny, but then I realized that they're actually very sad, <laughs> which um, is unlocked a lot of things actually to hear it said out loud. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think, I think in first draft, it always kind of the humor is a bit of a coping mechanism. And then I work to figure out what the humor is masking um, and try to make sure that those things are in sync and not just, not still just a coping mechanism. But I don't know. I think I watched too much Simpsons when I was growing up, maybe is also part of the problem. I, I had a lot of free time as a, as a child and, and the, I can't help but try to take the piss out of something sometimes as well. <laughs> yeah, you know, it took me a long time to come around to writing humor, even though, um, you know, I come from a family of humorists and, um, uh, and it's sort of my natural way of, of communicating and my natural way, so my natural defense system uh, and humor can also be used as a weapon, as every Midwesterner knows, and those indirect around the table family gatherings, right? Um, so, you know, I was kind of trained in it before I ever started writing it. And it took me a while because, um, you know, I was writing environmental literature and I, you know, <laughs> there's not a lot to laugh about in what's going on with the environment. And so I can see why the tradition often doesn't include much of it or hadn't at the time I started working in it. But I think I found that, uh, you know, experienced and others experienced it too, that sense of paralysis, right? In the face of all these problems and humor, especially self-deprecating humor, a kind of embracing of an attempt to embrace hum humility and um, fallibility and mistakes, uh, not to be afraid to confess them, to laugh at them and, get beyond them and actually do some work in the world, both as an individual, but I think also collectively. And that's been a part of the creative nonfiction tradition going back to Montaigne and, and well before. Um, so that's really sort of what it comes from. It, it's a kind of humor that comes out of, I think, out of pain. And as Sean was saying, you know, that sadness and humor exist together, right? And feed into one another and give each other it, it, urgency. And so I, that's sort of, where it comes from for me. Fantastic, thanks. Other people in the audience? Yeah, Andrew Furman, please. Sure, I have a question for Jennifer. Um, I really appreciated your reading, I, I really loved it. I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship between the visual art that we saw and your your written um, your writing basically. Um, I just noticed specifically all the birds, and so <laughs> I'm a bird watcher, so I, I definitely noticed that. Um, so you could speak to you know why birds occupied so many of so much of that space visually and just generally. If you want, if you want to just talk about generally about the relationship between the two, I'd I'd love to hear that. Sure. Thank you. Um... I've been, well, during the pandemic, I was home for a long time with, with two young kids. And so I didn't do much writing, but I did have time to do postcard collages. And that was kind of my creative outlet for a while. And I've been starting to play around with how I can combine the two and how the postcards and what I'm doing with them. Because most of the postcards 
were, are about the environment or are about climate change or about human environment relationships. So I've been thinking a lot about how they're exploring the same themes as I often explore in my writing and thus how I can combine them. In that particular piece, I drafted a lot of prose and then I also had this series of postcards I'd created a week after Roe v. Wade was overturned, but also on the same day as the EPA, the environment, the EPA ruling came out. So when I created those postcards, I was thinking both about women's rights and bodily autonomy and Roe v. Wade and environmental policy. So they just kind of merged in the postcards I created on that particular day. And as I was working with the pros in that piece, I found that I just needed space between a lot of the sections and the paragraphs. I needed that long pause. And yet I needed something for me and readers to contemplate in there that would soften it and give space for transitions. And I looked at the postcards that I had created around the same time and looked at the prose that I'd written around the same time and saw that they, they interwove in interesting ways. And then I had fun playing with where which postcard goes where and how that would come together. I have a lot of birds though, because my colleague Sandy Longhorn, who is here in the audience, collages, and I've borrowed a lot of material from her and she likes birds <laughs> and has a lot of birds. So I've borrowed many bird cutouts from Sandy. Are there questions or comments from the audience? John, are you working out at Planet Fitness or somewhere else? What's the rest of the story? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I haven't been back. You know, it's, it's sad. And um, I'm almost afraid to go back. It did move and, um, you know, I just haven't returned, obviously, because of COVID concerns. I kept my membership yeah. all those years just to support it. And also because they were one of the few um, businesses early on that were requiring masks um, to go in there. And I wanted to support that. They lost a lot of members because of that. So, um, but I don't, I don't know if I explained this fully, but some of you already know this Planet Fitness has this weird tradition of providing free pizza on the first Monday of every month. And that goes back to, um, uh, apparently I did some research, a, a store, their first store in Connecticut where they ran out of hot water and as a thank you to their customers, they they provided free pizza and then that kind of spread throughout. So it's kind of a weird, and they also have first, they have second Tuesday bagel morning where they did, but these are all gone now. That's one of the victims of, of you know, the, of the pandemic, but yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to say I haven't been back yet, and um, I'm sort of dealing myself for that because I don't know what's happened. Right? I don't know who's going to be there when I return. So, yeah. Susan, yeah, as a fan of creative nonfiction, I was reminded tonight why I love it so much. Um, but I'm wondering what you think the gifts of creative nonfiction are for you, what can you say in that that you have not been able to say in some other genre if you've ever tried? Uh, just curious about that. Thank you. Sean, well, I, did you start as a poet? Oh, I'm, I'm go ahead, Jenny. I went when I went to my master's program I applied in fiction but ended up writing a poetry thesis and then I went to do a PhD in creative writing and I applied in fiction and ended up doing creative nonfiction. so in some ways I feel like creative nonfiction is the genre I avoided for a long time but the genre that kept coming back to me and what I love about it is it grounds me in reality and helps me understand the actual world I exist in and to explore that. And that I think is what I was always trying to do in poetry and fiction, but creative nonfiction gave me the space to do that more directly. I think I had a kind of similar journey to Jenny. I, I actually, I entered my MFA 
mostly as a fiction person who wrote mostly poetry and hated writing fiction and was just kind of confused. Um, and then I, I took to writing essays, which were just kind of scribbled notes about things that had happened that it turned into uh, full-fledged stories. But I, I think in terms of the gifts that I, the reason I continue to do it and not just because I needed to draft stuff for workshops, um, but I find as a reader and as a writer, I, I, I find my most, I find I'm most compelled by being able to kind of communicate with the art that I love and the, and the that's both in text and music and all these things. And I find nonfiction is a great space to kind of not just reflect, but also to kind of open up conversations with um, other authors and other artists who I've kind of in, influenced and inspired me, but also who I wish I could enter in a real discourse with, but and not being able to do that, we just try to meet on the page instead. Um, and I feel like in a way that um, I haven't been able to do in fiction or poetry. Yeah, um, nonfiction has been my first and only genre love affair. And it started in undergraduate school. I was a refugee actually from the sciences. I was pre-med, I was majoring in or interested in chemistry and biology. And um, I kind of accidentally stumbled into a creative nonfiction class. We didn't use that term back in back in the 80s. It was called advanced writing. And that's, I think that's how a lot of creative nonfictions existed back courses back then they were kind of hidden right and they were you had to kind of find them and discover them accidentally and I was really struggling with whether I was going to continue on uh, with the pre-medicine and I was and I was also taking some humanities courses literature courses that I loved but I was working at a hospital in in Iowa City uh, with uh, some some of the kids in that is the children's hospital and some of the kids there were terminally ill and I was experiencing a lot of feelings and emotions uh, that I didn't really have any words for. And that class, because I was taking it simultaneously and I was working the night shift at this hospital. And as you, some of you know, as a nursing assistant, it's one of the most intimate sort of jobs you can have in a hospital um, with patients. Um, I started to sort of see things as a writer did, right? Being attentive in that way to what's going on in here as well as what's going on out there. And the result, one night was just simply writing down some of my feelings and thoughts and observations on back of prescription slip. And that ended up becoming the first essay I ever, ever wrote. And that eventually was published in creative nonfiction and ended up in one of my books. So it's really bizarre, but I think what that process did when it was, um, when it was first workshopped and the feelings I had with that, it, it revealed to me that you know, medicine isn't the only healing art. You know, a true story written out of your life um, for someone in, in, into another life. Um, the experiences, sharing those experiences with others is, is also a kind of healing force. At least that's how I experienced it. And so that was the beginning for me with nonfiction and I haven't, I haven't ever turned back with it. There's another comment in the in the chat. Sivens, we got time for one more? Great. So Wendy is asking everyone, if there is time, could you each talk about how you conjure the bravery to write for what you do? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well okay I'll say go, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead John <laughs> yeah you know bravery is a big word and and that's um I think you you know I feel honored that you you feel that way about what I what I shared and um uh, for me it really has to do with um a sense of responsibility, right? I'm actually a very uh, shy person, an introverted person. So um, public speaking, for instance, is still pretty terrifying for me. Language has always been a problem for me in a lot of ways. I've stumbled over it. I've had issues with it. That's, I think, why I became a writer. Right? I just wanted to slow things down um, and make language do what I wanted it to do. 
But I think with every piece in every you know book I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm thinking about the responsibility I have to others to tell a particular story. Um, it could be about place. It could be about family. Um, in the hopes that maybe someone out there uh, will feel less alone uh, with whatever they're experiencing that I share. Um, and so that's sort of where it begins begins with me, um, that, that sense of connection and, and responsibility. Go ahead, Sean. Uh, yeah, I, I was just gonna echo what John was saying. I feel like uh, once I feel that I have a story that's worth telling that maybe resonates beyond my own personal anxieties, then I, uh, it becomes less about bravery and more about how can I shape it in a way that um, might make that connection. And, and like I was saying, I, I, I write so much in response to events in my own life, but also into um, conversation that I, I think that if I can Im imagine a reader um, then it becomes less the feeling of getting over a nerve that I might share something I don't want to share and more, but how can I share this in a way that's um, meaningful and hopefully resonant? I don't think I struggle too much with bravery when drafting. I'm pretty, I've always found writing to be a space where I can be pretty direct and specific and brave and, and say, you know, use that as a space to explore what it is I want to explore. It's publishing where that those questions come up a little more, especially with some of the essays I've been working on about motherhood. I do think about my kids reading these pieces eventually, or, you know, how might those pieces impact them, but I'm really motivated with the pieces about motherhood on making space for complicated experiences of motherhood and I think so often there isn't space right because complicated experiences of motherhood have often been silenced or shamed and so it's not really about me it's about me wanting to make sure there's room in the world for people who've had those experiences or or recognize themselves in them and you know, I'm still terrified sometimes when I publish a particularly vulnerable piece on motherhood, but I also believe in the piece and believe wholeheartedly at that point in, in what it's saying and that what it's saying has value in societal conversations so that that's a large enough motivation. Just to add briefly onto that, I do think what you're, what Sean and, and Jenny are talking about, that ethical dimension, I think is maybe for me the key distinction between creative nonfiction and fiction and poetry even though that certainly can be present in those genres in terms of techniques they're very similar right essays can read very much like poems memoirs can read very much like novels short stories but there is this sense right with every sentence you write it can impact real people right and they know who they are and in the mom in fiction that you might be able to cover up your mom in fiction but in nonfiction, everyone knows who the mom is Right, and they can call her up and talk to her about your book. Um, so, and that changes not only what we put in, you know, and leave out, but everything at the sentence level, adjectives, everything else. That ethical dimension um, and impact is is a part of that relationship to truth. Everything else um, that we confront in our nonfiction. So, and like Jenny, I don't like to think about it too early. I first have to write the drafts and figure out what I'm going to say, and then I worry about the other stuff later. But that to me is the distinguishing characteristic of nonfiction. This has been wonderful conversation. Thank you, thank you all. Can we have another hand for our authors? And a question, are any of you authors on Twitter? If so, you wanna fling that in the chat? You got followers. I'm under strict instructions to get on Twitter, but I haven't yet. I'm going to though. I promised my kids. <laughs> well, let me jump in here and thank Elizabeth Dodd for doing such a terrific job of hosting these wonderful readers. And of course, thank our readers tonight. 
John and, and Jenny and Sean, and, and thanks to, uh, to all of our audience members. Really, what a wonderful, wide-ranging and powerful, all of them powerful readings uh, this evening. So thanks for joining us. It's a great way to start off fall, and I think our, our reading series. And, um, you know, have a wonderful night, everyone. <laughs>